this, this evening and we can feast upon the Word of God, Lord, and we just thank you for, for what's in those scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. There's so much there for us. And I, Lord, I pray, Lord, that the Spirit of the Word go out in power and uh, that you just anoint Brother Mike and fill him with your spirit as he speaks the Word. And I pray, Lord, it would change our lives in a way that would be uh, pleasing in your sight. I look at the world today and I, I just pray, Lord, we, we need the power of your spirit. spirit. We've got to walk in the power of the Spirit because this world is really crumbling. It's, uh, the hope is really um, very shallow. But, Lord, you are the blessed hope. And we just thank you that you give us the hope and the peace that passes all understanding. No matter what circumstance comes our way, you are the God that supplies all our needs according to riches and glory through Christ Jesus. And you're so faithful. And we just ask that you bless this evening, tonight. And Lord, we just give this in your hands. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. So Tiffany and I, some of you know, Tiffany and I were on uh, vacation to Oregon the last 11 days. We flew back Monday night. It was a good time. It was Tiffany's folks' uh, 50th wedding anniversary. Spent four days with them and her brother and sister. And then we spent four days with my parents and saw my sister and her adult children and all of their little ones. And that was quite sobering because I remember them at 12 and now there's, you know, five or six babies running around. And I thought, what happened to me? <laughs> I'm getting very old very quick. But it was wonderful. And then we spent some time with some friends. So but I can say... It was, I mean, it was wonderful seeing family and friends, but towards the end, I, I started feeling like, I really miss the church people. <laughs> I really did. I really miss. So I'm quite excited to be back. So thank you very much for being my church family. I appreciate it. So uh, that last song that we sang, Have Thine Own Way, that line, uh, Thou art the potter, I am the clay, whenever we sing that, it reminds me um, the name Adam, the first man, Adam, in Hebrew, Adam means man, and the two Hebrew root words that form that is red and clay. Like red, like blood, like life, and clay. He's, Adam was the living clay in the potter's hands, the first man. And whenever we sing that, it reminds me, it just humbles me. I'm like, yes, Lord, you are the potter, I am the clay. So, so here we are, we're in uh, Second Chronicles, finally, huh? This is great. And uh, no giant list of names for me to try to mispronounce for you. Oh, <laughs> yay. So I think two weeks ago, Pastor Scott finished out First Chronicles, right? Is that right? Two weeks ago? And there at the end, uh, Solomon's anointed king. And, uh, you know, it talks about the closing of David's life and the closing of his reign, right? So David, uh, Solomon's father, King David, passed away. And so the Second Chronicles opens up with this young king, Solomon. He's young, and uh, he's been put in this place. And um, the writer of the books of Chronicles, first and second, is Ezra. Ezra wrote these books. And, um, you know, we went through first and second kings quite a while back. And, uh, you know, this covers a lot of the same things, except Ezra approaches it from a very different perspective, and he kind of generalizes some things. So sometimes we go back to first kings to get a few more details. We've done that. So here, we'll just start, we'll read verse 1, and we'll talk about it, okay? So Second Chronicles chapter 1, verse 1. Here we go. It says, Now Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom, and the Lord his God was with him and exalted him exceedingly. Now, the one thing I noticed as I was studying this, Ezra, as we're reading through this, he puts these little tidbits in there that don't seem totally necessary, but when you read them, you realize that Ezra is kind of anticipating the questions and gives you a little information to answer them ahead of time. And what I'm talking about here, it says, Now Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom. Now, we don't have to go back there, but in 1 Kings chapter 1 and chapter 2 also opens up with uh, the reign of King David being transferred to Solomon. And those first two chapters, which gives you a lot more details, it talks about the people who resisted that. Uh, Solomon's older half-brother tried to uh, take the kingdom before David was even dead. And if you remember, Nathan the prophet went to Bathsheba and said to her, hey, you know, did you really intend for this other guy to be king? 
and then Bathsheba went to David, and then David put the crown on Solomon's head and put him on the throne, if you remember that. And uh, Joab, King David's general, joined in that coup. And uh, so did, um, so did Abathar, the uh, priest, King David's high priest, joined there too. And, um, and that, all that was put down. And um, so, when, so when Ezra says, in, uh, when Solomon, son of David, here in Second Chronicles verse 1, he was strengthening his kingdom, he's kind of quickly brushing over the fact that it was kind of a rocky start for Solomon, okay? And that's how it goes with kings. They're always weakest when they first take power. That's when they're most vulnerable. And so that's why you always have these attempted coups and other brothers jockeying for position during this transfer of power. Okay, so Ezra kind of taps into that and kind of clues us into that in that first verse. And here we are in uh, verse 2, and it says, And Solomon spoke to all of Israel, so all of the people, uh, to the captains of the thousands and of hundreds, so he goes out, he's talk, he goes and he, he uh, has a, starts talking to the people in a conciliatory manner, okay? He's going to the people wisely and kind of bringing everyone into the fold, okay? To, to uh, get everyone on the same page that he's the king. He goes to the military and he talks to them, does the same thing. Uh, so he talks to the captains of thousands and of hundreds. He talks to the judges. And if you remember, uh, the Lord commanded that Throughout Israel, each city was to elect a judge for that city. And then the Lord instructed that if a case was too hard for that judge or too uncertain, then it was to be escalated up to a Levite judge. And remember, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, how the Levites had appointed judges who spread out through all of Israel, and they were kind of like the court of appeals. And then finally, if it was too hard for even them, it could go all the way up to the high priest, who would then go before the Lord and use the two stones. Remember, anyone remember what those two stones were called? Yeah, the Urim, Urim and Thurim, right? And that he would go before the Lord and the Lord would decide. So you have this structure of a judicial structure all the way up to the Supreme Court, okay? So Solomon goes to the judges and he talks with them, getting them into the fold, into the conciliatory, uh, conciliatory into his kingdom. And then it says, and he talked to every leader in all of Israel, the heads of the father's houses. So I remember Israel is a tribal society. There are 12 tribes, and they all had their uh, leading men in each tribe, right? Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, they all had their leading men. And so he goes to all these powers, uh, power uh, groups. They all had political power in their own way. And he kind of bring. that's what he's saying. He's bringing them all in. He's talking to them, getting them all to agree that, yes, he's the new king. And, uh, you know, as we talk about that, what does that remind you of? It's kind of like our nation, isn't it? We have the states. We have judicial branch. We have the military. It's similar. It's similar. It's almost like our founding fathers based our country off of something. I don't know what, but something, right? So here in verse 3, it says, then Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place that was in Gibbon, for the tabernacle of the meeting with God was there, which Moses, the servant of God, had made in the wilderness. Verse 4. But David had brought up the ark of God from Kajoth, Kerjath, uh, Jerem, to the place David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it at Jerusalem. So after Solomon, in, in verse 2, goes to everyone, gets everyone on the same page, then Solomon brings the congregation to the Lord, to the tabernacle, to, to, um, to devote his kingdom, this kingship, in front of the Lord, okay, which is a cool thing. And the situation between verse 3 and verse 4 here, the tabernacle, which is the tabernacle that Moses had made, at this point, it's 480 years old, okay? It's been 480 years. And uh, the tabernacle is in this town in Gibbon, in the region. And uh, that's in the tabernacle is still the altar, the, our altar sa sacrifice. Still got the table of showbread, the menorah, uh, the uh, altar of incense. The only thing that wasn't there was what? The ark, right? Because David had taken it into Jerusalem. 
And it says that David brought the ark there at the end of verse 4. He brought the ark into Jerusalem and pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem. And, you know, as I was studying this, it really, I suddenly realized, well, wait a minute, this is a very odd situation. Why did David separate the ark from the tabernacle? It's actually kind of a problem because how is the high priest to do his job, which is to offer the sacrifice for the people once a year and then go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood on the ark if the ark's not there? How does that work and why? Um, and I don't know, and I, I, I don't know why David didn't just bring the whole tabernacle. It seems like he should have. And I bring this up because we're going to find out in a few minutes that um, this set up a situation where you had two priests going on. And we'll read about it in a few minutes. But anyways, uh, Solomon and all the people, they go to their tabernacle to the altar, the sacrificial altar. And uh, again, Ezra throws in a little tidbit here. Two of them, actually. One, he, he points out that, yes, this indeed is the same tabernacle that Moses had built. It's not some other new tabernacle. And then... Um, and then he points out again, but the ark wasn't there. It was in Jerusalem. Okay? Uh, let's uh, look at this a little closer. Let's go. We talked about the situation where we have the ark and the tabernacle separated from one, each, one another. So go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 11. 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 11. So this is a chapter talking about how David brought the ark into Jerusalem. And if you remember, the first try didn't work out so well, right? Because he put it on that brand new cart, which was contrary to what God had said. He said that the priests were supposed to carry it. And then it started to fall, and the guy touched it, and he died. David got scared, and then later on he decided to go ahead and do it the right way, and the priest carried the ark in. Okay, so that's this chapter here. And so we're in, um, again, uh, second, First Chronicles 15, verse 11, okay? <clears throat> and David called for Zadok and Abathar the priest, and for the Levites, for, the, for Uriel, Asiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliah, and Amadab. He said to them, you are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. So Ezra tells us here in verse 11 that David goes to the priest, two of them, Zadok and Abathar. Okay, no, so there's two of them. Now skip down to verse um, 16. Then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be singers accompanied by the instruments of music, string instruments, harps, and cymbals, by raising the voice with a resounding joy. So the Levites appointed Hemam, the son of Joel, and of his brethren Asaph, the son of Barakchiah, and of their brethren, the sons of Moriah, Ethan, the son of Jeshuiah, and with them their brethren on the second rank, Zechariah, Ben, and Jeziah, Shemariah, Jabeth, Yunan, Benim, Mesnea, my tongue's starting to get tight here. I did it to myself. Matthiah, Elphim, Micaiah, Obed-Edom, and Jael, the gatekeepers. So uh, he points these guys to, string, to play music before the Lord in front of the ark, which is in Jerusalem. Okay? And um, this is the point where we see uh, Zadok. Zadok, the second priest, he actually ends up staying with the tabernacle, okay? And Abathar, he stays with the ark. And if you remember the stories of King David when he's running from Saul, Abathar was the priest that was with him. So he's uh, an old friend of King David's and he ends up becoming David's counselor. Okay, so he's in Jerusalem with the ark. Zadok's with the rest of the holy instruments, the tabernacle, and the altar of sacrifice. So you got this two, these two guys, okay? So now uh, flip back to 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 26. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 26. So 
So this is uh, King David. This is Solomon speaking. It says, And to Abathar the priest, the king said, Go to Anathah to your own fields, for you are deserving of death. But I will not put you to death at this time, because you carried the ark of the Lord before my father, David. And because you were afflicted every time my father was afflicted. So Solomon removed Abathar from being priest to the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord, which he spoke concerning the house of Eli at Shiloh. So Abathar, the second priest who was with David in Jerusalem and the ark, and he's David's confidant and his close priest friend, it tells us right here, Solomon tells him, he puts him into exile because Abathar had joined in that rebellion with Solomon's older uh, half-brother. But he refuses to kill him because he's a priest and he carried the ark. And because, as it says, that he was with David and was afflicted whenever David was afflicted, speaking of when David was running from Saul. And then right at the end here, Ezra points out that this was in fulfillment of prophecy, which we'll see in a little bit. Okay? So that means that Zadok is now the only high priest, and he is with the tabernacle. So back to uh, Second Chronicles. And we are um, there in verse 5. So the whole, all of Israel and Solomon, they go to uh, the tabernacle to offer sacrifices on the altar. Verse 5. Now the bronze altar that Bazel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, had made, he put before the tabernacle of the Lord. Okay, so Ezra is pointing out that this is the original altar. And if you remember, all the way back when Moses was building the tabernacle, there was a craftsman that God provided who was skilled in all kinds of trade. And that's this guy. And Ezra is bringing his name up to point out the fact that this is indeed the same altar. Okay? Solomon and the assembly sought him, God, there. And Solomon went up from there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which, as, which was at the tabernacle of the meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. Verse 7, And on, on that night God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask, what shall I give you? So here's this young king. He goes to the Lord and offers sacrifices. And that night the Lord appears to him and speaks to him and tells him, Ask me anything you want and I'll give it to you. He writes Solomon a blank check. This is pretty impressive. And what we need to understand here is God isn't doing this because he's so impressed with a thousand burnt offerings. It actually had nothing to do with that, okay? How do I know that? All right, well, go to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 15. I think this is a very familiar song. Psalm 51, verse 15. Psalm 51, verse 15. says, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. So when we see God come to Solomon in the, in the night, it isn't because of this great sacrifice. It was because where that was coming from. And what we need to understand here is this young king, he's feeling the weight of this responsibility. He's, he's nervous. He's scared. He feels that pressure. He's standing in King David's shadow, if you will. And, you know, David had given Solomon the task of building the temple and we talked about how much David has set aside, how much gold and silver and cedar and wood. We talked about that last month, right? And so here's Solomon, who is now the king. He's young, and he's feeling the pressure, okay? And so he goes to the Lord in earnest, in honesty, because he knows he can't do it. He doesn't, he's not equipped. And I can say that because of what we're about ready to read. You can see his heart there. And so this broken contrite heart of this young man 
pleases the Lord. So the Lord comes to him and says, ask me anything and I'll give it to you. That's what we're reading here. Verse 8, And Solomon said to God, You have shown great mercy to David my father and have made me king in his place. So Solomon recognizes that he's there because God put him there. He sees it. Verse 9, Now, O Lord, God, let your promise to my, David, my father, be established, for you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. So that line, you have made me king over a people that is like the dust of the earth in multitude. So you can see he's feeling it. He's really understanding the, the gravity of this position that he is now in. Verse 10. Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. Like uh, going out and coming in, this is just a phrase meaning that I'd be leader of this people. Give me wisdom and knowledge that I'd be a good leader of this people. Perhaps it's kind of like the idea of like a shepherd leading the sheep out and then leading them back in, like a good shepherd being a good leader. Go, that I may go out and come in before your people. Give me wisdom and knowledge. For who can judge this great people of yours? And so you see this young man who's asking for wisdom, but you're already seeing wisdom in his request, aren't you? He's recognizing, I am unequipped, Lord, to do this job. Look at all these people, and they're your people. How am I going to do this? You have to give this to me. I can't do it on my own. Verse 11, Then God said to Solomon, Because this was in your heart, and you have not asked for riches or wealth, or honor, or the life of your enemies. Nor have you asked uh, for long life, but have asked for wisdom and knowledge for yourself, that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. So the Lord's impressed with Solomon. He's impressed with Solomon's heart. He's pleased. And he says, because, and he, and he points out, this was not just a, um, a flippant thing, or he wasn't, didn't really mean it. He was just trying to be, you know, political with God. He actually says this was in his heart. Solomon really felt this way because he didn't ask for riches or wealth or honor or long life or victory over his enemies, uh, but he asked for wisdom and knowledge. Why? That you may judge my, judge my people over whom I have made you king. Verse 12. Actually, before we go there, let's flip over to... Um, Let's flip over to 1 Samuel chapter 2, okay? 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we're in verse 12. And we talked a little bit about these two priests. And if you remember, after, um, and it relates to what we just read, but after uh, that last line that Ezra put in after Abathar was exiled, it said, in fulfillment of prophecy, right? Remember, we just read it. So let's go there and let's look at that, okay? And the reason why we're going there is because there's a verse in there that relates to what we just read, and it's very powerful. So we're in 1 Samuel 2, verse 12. I'm in the wrong book. Give me a second. First Samuel 2, verse 12. Okay, so this is pre-4, King Saul, and so there are judges ruling Israel. And here it is. Uh, Eli is a priest. He's a high priest, and he's running Israel, and he is raising Samuel. Uh, but Samuel's still a boy at this point. And here in verse 12, it says, Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. Now go down to 22, verse 22. Now Eli was very old, and he heard everything that his sons did to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. So Eli is very old, and so he's, uh, his sons are actually running the show, running the country for him. And they, as I said, did not know the Lord. They're very corrupt. And it got to the point where the prostitutes were standing in front of the, t the tabernacle. That's what they gather, and these two priests were sleeping with these prostitutes right outside the door of the, the Lord's temple, tabernacle. 
So Eli uh, hears of it. So verse 23, so he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. Verse 24, no, my sons, for it is not good, it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. So Eli tells us is giving his sons a, a tongue lashing, and he's saying you're leading God's people into sin. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. And the problem here is, is that is all Eli did. He just chewed him out, but he didn't really take any action that he had the power to do to stop this. And then verse 26, And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor with both the Lord and with men. Verse 27, Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer, up my, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me? Did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offerings, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people? Verse 30, therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And it goes on, he pronounces judgment against the house of Eli and says that the priesthood would be removed from it. And we saw that when King Solomon exiled Abathar he was the last of that house. And the reason why we're kind of touching upon this is that last verse there. But now the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And we go back to Solomon, this young boy who has been given a blank check from the Lord. And his heart is, Lord, give me wisdom to lead your people. He's honoring God. Right? It wasn't about him, it was about being a good steward of what God had given, which is really lifting God high, isn't it? And what did the Lord do? He said, okay, because you asked for this, I'm going to give that to you, and I'm going to give you all these other things, the riches, the fame, the glory, the power, peace. Solomon never really fought any wars, right? His land had peace. Um, and he was greatly honored by the Lord. And you see why? It's because he honored God. And um, this verse is um, a very special verse to me. I thought about not telling it, but, you know, Timmy and I, when we moved here in 2019, uh, one of the main reasons why we moved here in 2019 was because in 2018, I, uh, I suffered a, um, a, 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 a nervous breakdown. That's my story. And that year, 2018 through 2019, was to this point, the hardest year of my entire life. I was a very, very broken person. And um, the Lord said to us, you're moving to, to uh, Arizona. And so we spent a year looking for a job that never appeared. And then when I finally just said, okay, Lord, I trust you, you provide a job, then it suddenly appeared, <laughs> right? That's how it worked. And then we show up in 2019. So part of the story is, is I turn in my notice at work in Oregon and I'd been there 15 years. And one of the last days I was there, I was in a, I work in a factory. I was with some guys working on a machine, fixing the machine, and I hear this commotion. I look up, and in comes this stream of people, about 15, engineers, managers, and they're clapping, and they're hooting and hollering for me. And I stood there, and at first I was obviously very taken back, and then I realized what they were doing. They were giving me a send-off. Here I was, this very broken man, and all these non-believers are hooting and hollering and clapping for me to say, hey, you know, it's been good working with you. I'd never seen that happen in the factory. And of course, everyone in the factory is looking down, trying to figure out what the noise was. 
And, you know, I'm standing there, I'm trying not to cry, and I'm feeling very humbled. And of course, I thank everyone, and they go. And I turn back, we continue our job, and I just pray to myself, I said, Lord, why did you do that? Why did you do that? I'm nobody special. I, the guys I'm working next to do the same job I do. We're all doing the same job. Why me? And immediately he quoted this verse, I honor those who honor me. That's why I bring this verse up, and that's why when I read Solomon, and, you know, I didn't deserve it. The Lord just did it because he could, because I was hurting, and it helped me out. And, uh, you know, he brought us to Arizona and to this church, and things have been wonderful. He's been, we've been blessed. But this verse is very important to me, and, you know, I encourage everyone, especially men, to sear this verse into your mind, sear it into your heart. If you want to be a person who is respected and honored, then you need to honor the Lord. That's where it starts, right? And, you know, for women, what does it say? Uh, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. It's the same thing. The fear of the Lord, shall, you will be praised. A man who honors God will be honored. And that's where it starts. And so I read, I read King Solomon, this young man. He's feeling scared. I kind, of, you know, I kind of identify with that. And then he asked God for wisdom to be a good steward of the people that he's been put in charge of. And God says, all right, I can deal with that. And he gives him honor. So here, we're back in First Chronicles. Actually, sorry, no, we're not in First Chronicles. See, I start telling stories and I lose track. I don't want to do that again. Second Chronicles, um, chapter one, verse 12. So Laura continues. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have the like. So the Lord tells Solomon, you're going to have wisdom and knowledge like you asked, but I'm going to add to you wealth and riches and honor, such like no other king has ever had nor will have the like. It's just a cool, cool thing for Solomon. This is a mountaintop experience for Solomon. So this next half of the chapter is kind of a bucket of cold water. It relates. Ezra throws us in. It's kind of out of place. Ezra throws us in, and uh, he basically talks about, we're going to read it. He talks about King Solomon's wealth <clears throat> in relation to um, what God had just got done saying. But what we're going to see here is Solomon is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, Solomon is, is um, he fails in this next section. So here we are, verse 13. So Solomon came to Jerusalem from the high place that was at Gibeon, from before the tabernacle of the meeting, and reigned over Israel. <clears throat> and Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, he had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Okay, a while back when we were reading about David conquering, I believe it was Moab, he had captured, I believe, 1,000 chariots, and then it gave a number for a number of horsemen, and we had to figure it out that one chariot probably had something like six to eight horses associated with it, four horses to drive it, and then when those horses tired out, you had to have other horses to switch out with it in the middle of the battle to keep the chariot moving, okay? So he had, uh, King Solomon had uh, 1,400 chariots, which means he had approximately 20,000 horses to drive these chariots, including whatever horses he had for single riders. So he had a lot of horses. That's what I'm trying to say. So he had uh, 1,400 ho chariots and 12,000 horsemen who were stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. So he had so many horses and chariots, he actually had cities just devoted to housing all this, horses and chariots. Verse 15, And the king made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stones, and he made cedars as abundant as the sycamore, which are in the lowland. And Solomon had horses imported from Egypt and Kaveh, 
The king's merchants brought them in, bought them in Kavei at the current price. So the reason why I said this section, which is basically a real quick general brush up of King Solomon's life, is kind of like a bucket of cold water because we just read about this incredible mountaintop experience with Solomon. This next section, which is talking about his wealth, unfortunately is also talking about his failure. And uh, the reason why is, is we're going to find out. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. So this is God giving directions to the people as they're going to go into the promised land. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. And God says, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. Verse 15. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brethren, but he shall not multiply horses for himself nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall you multiply wives for yourselves, lest he, his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Now look, we just got done reading all these horses that Solomon had all these chariots, and it says that he went into Egypt to get these ho Egyptian horses. They bred the best horses. Talks about how he made gold and silver as common as stones. And, uh, you know, we, the principle here that we read, the reason why the Lord did not want the king to do this was several reasons. One, if the king is multiplying war horses to himself, he's building an army, what he is saying is is that I don't trust that the Lord is going to defend this nation, so I'm going to prepare a large army to defend this nation, right? And the spiritual aspect is, is that you've got to go into Egypt to get those horses, and, and God had paid a price to save his people out of Egypt. He crossed them through the Red Sea into the Promised Land, crossed them from death to life, okay, spiritually speaking. He does not want them to return, and so what you see here, God is saying, don't distrust my protection of you and turn back to the world, okay? And for you and I as believers, what the, what the reminder here is, as paid-for, spirit-filled Christians, when we get in a situation, our first fleshly reaction is to go back to the way we used to do things, we do things in our flesh. We go back to the world. And God is saying, don't go back to Egypt. Don't do it. Because you're saying, I don't trust you, God. I'm going to build this big army with big horses. Okay? And remember, when David captured all those chariots from Moab, he burnt them all. He burnt them all. And it also says in the section of Deuteronomy, he's, in verse 17, it says, Neither shall he multiply wise for himself. Why? Lest his heart turn away. Now, I think we all know what happened with Solomon and his wives, but we'll go read it. Go to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. And we're in verse 1. 1 Kings 11 verse 1. But King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonites, and the Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after other gods. So God, so Solomon goes and he marries all these foreign ladies. And understand this is not saying that interracial marriage is wrong. It's interfaith marriage is the problem here. He's marrying these ladies who are idol worshipers. And God told them not to do this. Why? Well, we just read it in Deuteronomy because it would turn the king's heart away. And again, uh, the writer of Kings says, uh, points out, God said, surely they will turn your hearts away after their gods. 
okay? Solomon clung to these women in love, verse 3, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. Okay, so 1,000 women. And his wives turned his heart, just as the Lord said would happen. And you've got to understand something. 1,000 a, a women would mean that you could be with one wife and you wouldn't see her again for three years. Right? Three years. And that is not what God intended. Can you imagine? There's no, there's no love there. There's no unity there. Okay? This is about the flesh and lust. Verse 4. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Verse 5. For Solomon went after Ashereth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord, as did his father David. Verse 7. Then Solomon built high places for Cheshmush, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem. And I think this one's the worst. And for Moloch, the abomination of the Ammonites. Moloch's the one they did all the child sacrifice to. Okay, he's the demon that's still rampant in our country with abortion. Okay, because it's demons behind all these idols. He's the one we're sacrificing our children to. For Moloch, the abomination of the people of Ammon, and he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods, just like God said would happen. And it's interesting because Solomon asked for, it's a, it's a tough thing to struggle with as we read about Solomon because he said he was the wisest man, and yet he's a fool in this. And how? But you've got to understand, it says when he was old, he did these things. And it's not like this happened the next day. This was a slow process, one compromise at a time throughout his life until he had gotten to this point, so far from the truth. This man had God directly talk to him, directly, verbally, twice. Okay, he built the temple. He had the example of his father, David. And yet, here he is at the end of his life, so far away from the truth. Very, very foolish, I would say. So back here, we'll finish this chapter in first, uh, Second Chronicles, chapter 1, verse 17. They also acquired and imported from Egypt a chariot for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. Thus, through their agents, they ex exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. So again, uh, Ezra throws us in there, and he's kind of including us into how Solomon generated all this wealth. He was a merchant. He went to Egypt. He went to this other place. He bought horses and chariots for himself, but he also bought them at the current price, turned around and upsold them for a profit to the kingdoms north of him. Okay, And uh, so Ezra is kind of hinting at how Solomon grew this great amount of wealth. Okay. Um, I don't think we have time for the next chapter. We'll probably save that for next week. Like I said, I think the key, key takeaways here are this. Uh, two things. If you want to be honored by God, we said if you want to be honored, a person of honor, then you need to honor God, right? What did Jesus say? He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added to you. And understand, I'm not talking about Solomon's wealth, okay? Money is going to burn, all right? We're talking about things honor and respect a person that kind of person that when people think of you they think of you as a someone that they would like to be like right that's what we're talking about uh the other thing is is you know we just got done looking at how solomon we did a very quick brief overview of solomon's life and how he fell and the takeaway for you and i is to abide to abide in jesus christ daily don't allow yourself like I did this whole last week and kind of didn't read my Bible like I should have. And then at the end of the week, I thought, man, why do I feel so crummy? I feel so crummy right now. And then I sit down to study this and I wake up and I go, oh, I feel wonderful. What happened? Well, I got my word, right? I think we've all been there, right? 
Abide in Christ. Don't allow yourself to slowly slip and develop the habit of being back in Egypt, back in the world. The two takeaways. Honor God. Abide in Christ. Okay? All right. A few minutes early, but we don't have enough time for the next chapter. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for your blessings, God. And I just want to thank you for the truth of your word and the refreshment of your word, Lord. And, you know, we talked about Solomon's wisdom, God, but your wisdom, the wisdom of the Spirit is so much more. I pray that you would fill us with that wisdom of your Spirit, that you would fill us with your Spirit, and that you would empower us to go out and honor you and to do, to do your will and to, to be good stewards of the things you've given us, Lord. May we always honor you. And uh, may you come quickly, Jesus. May we see your glory. And we, may we always lift you high. May you, we always lift your name high. Thank you for all that you've done for saving us. And I just pray a great blessing over this congregation, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Please come forward for prayer.